Uh, hi and good evening and welcome to another uh, episode of Education Matters with Jim O'Connell. Um, wonderful to have you uh, with us. If you are watching this on Tuesday, uh, the uh, 10th of uh, April, uh, then you're watching live at 6 p.m. We're live from 6 to 7 p.m. And the call-in number, as always, is 640-3091. That's area code 603-640-3091. And uh, this program is repeated um, on six or seven times or eight times during the week um, on Channel 23 here in uh, Manchester and uh, is also available um, usually after a couple of days delay. It's available on YouTube and on uh, IPM Nation um, where you can, if you so wished, you could uh, watch uh, previous episodes, etc. But anyway, you're very welcome. I'd love to have you, um, I'd love to have you uh, join us or call in. As always, um, uh, once the uh, topic is around education in the city of Manchester, or more generally in, in, on education, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts and comments. And uh, whether your thoughts uh, agree with mine or not, is, uh, is not, uh, you're not required to have to agree with me in order to, uh, to call in. So if you would like to uh, partake, certainly do, 640-3091. And again, if you're watching live, that number will be on the screen um, uh, as, you are, uh, as you're watching this. So, um, first of all, uh, it's uh, Tuesday afternoon, and as I'm uh, walking in here a while ago, and as I was driving, I had the occasion to be at the seacoast area, so I drove in on 101 just now, and it's snowing. And so, um, uh, not very much, but it's snowing, and it's actually sticking to the ground in places, so I'm amazed that here we are on April 10th, and, uh, and the weather is as it is, but I'm sure... You know, we'll be here in a week or two, and it'll be uh, it'll be ninety, such as uh, such as the weather in New Hampshire. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, small things. Uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to do tonight, I've been remiss a, a couple of times in the past when um, when uh, significant people in the city or when when uh, uh, people involved in our public life have have had uh, bereavements, etc. And I'd like to um, uh, tonight uh, recognize the fact that. Uh, uh, the Sapienza family lost their mum this past week, and Alderman Tony uh, Sapienza is well known to us. But the Sapienza family, from Phil up at Hillside, and and uh, a teacher at Hillside, and others are um, are uh, uh, friends of ours and good people. And so I want to wish them my uh, sincerest condolences um, at the loss of their of their mum. Um, the other thing is, uh, uh, moving on to uh, happier things, I think, is that uh, we had a, uh, a long uh, school board meeting last night, and uh, the, we should have a trumpet blast if we had one, um, but the redistricting plan, as proposed by Dr. Vargas, was passed. It was passed on an 8-5 to five vote, and so um, I'm, 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 I'm very pleased uh, that that has happened. Um, another uh, vote that uh, that happened last night was the uh, it was resolved that the school year uh, would begin next year on uh, the Wednesday after Labor Day. I believe it's the fifth. Um, I might I might have it right here on the website. Um, so uh, yeah, so in, on on uh, September fifth on the Wednesday. And uh, why I bring that up is because uh, Dr. Vargas had. Uh, had asked uh, that um, the school calendar change such that um, uh, that the schools would open and children would go back to school on the more on the Tuesday morning after Labor Day, and he wanted to do that. Uh, one of the primary reasons for it was because it was a hardship to parents who. Um, uh, once, once, uh, once the Labor Day weekend is all over, you know, uh, have to go and find babysitters or whatever to um, to look after kids on the Tuesday because Manchester waits to open until the Wednesday. And he mentioned and talked about the surrounding school districts who open on the Tuesday morning. And his point has been that you, you know Manchester is in the end in competition for students in this environment that we live in today and that people make choices based on the customer service or the customer friendliness of the system 
and that is everything from academic outcomes uh, to to straight up customer service. And so um, he brought this to the board. He had negotiations and discussions with the teachers on this. And um, under the teacher's contract, uh, the teachers, uh, as, as agreed between two years ago, or is it three years ago now, the most recent contract, which is coming to an end, but under the current contract, in any case, uh, teachers, uh, they, they, uh, the first day of school is on that Wednesday morning. Um, now, I, I talked about this briefly here, and these are strange words coming from my mouth because normally um, I am a big, um, and make no apologies for it because I think it's the right thing and I deeply believe it. I am a big uh, supporter of teachers because I, my, my, my worldview is and has been now for a long, long time that teachers are undervalued in society generally, kind of writ large, that the work that they do and the effect that they have on all our lives, each of us personally in our relations with our teachers back in the day, but the, the, the teachers who are teaching our, those of us who have children in the public school system or in the school system, that um, teachers have a, uh, outside after parents, they have the single largest influence on kids and therefore the single, single, single largest influence on, um, on our society. And, uh, and I, besides the issues in Manchester, which I think are particularly uh, egregious, um, the wrongs here are particularly egregious done to teachers in that they are undervalued more here perhaps than elsewhere. But um, but that's how I see it sort of happening generally. And we and we see we see this occurring in uh, Kentucky and in Oklahoma and you know where teachers haven't had a pay raise in ten years. Um, you know where they're uh, going to school uh, uh, in Kansas uh, four days a week because the schools can't o afford to be open uh, the fifth day because they have to save money on transportation, etc. So this is the nonsense we're being we're being dealt. Um, a terrible disservice is being dealt uh, to uh, students in public school systems across the country as the as the wave after wave after wave of attack on public education is continued by those who um, who uh, falsely believe that our public schools are somehow uh, horrible government institutions or something so it's all it's all driven by politics and uh, rhetoric and ideology but the things that have been done uh, that is being the things that are being done to our schools and to our children uh, in some other states is just atrocious if we look at uh, what has gone on in michigan uh, which was the, uh, the 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 petri dish of uh, betsy devos the current secretary of education and her um uh, her uh, spending fortunes on undermining the public school system there, which after spending almost a billion dollars over uh, years there, they, um, you could say that they've been successful in dragging it to its knees. And then if we, everybody from Sam Baumbach to to uh, many others in, in, uh, as governors uh, in, in other states have, uh, have overseen the... Uh, the uh, destruction of uh, of public schools, insofar as we see um, uh, schools that are um, are comp no longer functioning as schools, really, like I say, open four days a week uh, without any of the programs that they that they need to have, and so uh, the onslaught on our public schools. I, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but you know, if you if you look at this and you study it, it's it's just frightening. And we come back here to, to Manchester and we have, uh, you know, Senate Bill 193, which would, is sold by some as a voucher program. And we could argue that that's, that's like many other subjects in society in America, that people use certain words for it. And so it, it, it is made to sound innocuous and, and beneficial. Whereas in actual fact, when you, when you tear off the scab, the ugly sore underneath is that it will withdraw money from public education. And the thing that I would point out to you most importantly is that the people who are loudest in their voices in support of these kinds of programs are silent. I mean, absolutely silent when it comes to putting resources into our public schools.
There is a direct connection between those who introduce this bill after bill after bill that chips away at the edifice, at the structure that is public education, that I would argue has made this country what it is and will continue to make it and keep it competitive in the future. And they've been chipping away at it for perhaps decades now. And uh, it's, no, it's no surprise when a new bill is introduced, uh, written someplace in the Deep South perhaps, and then introduced by some uh, uh, follower um, in, in our House or Senate in the state of uh, New Hampshire. Um, the people who vote for these things, <coughs> they, 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 they go along in lockstep around <coughs> all the other sort of, you know, anti-government, and anti, you know, uh, um, they call themselves things like the liberty this and liberty candidates and I'm a liberty person. And like I don't know anybody who's anti-liberty, to be honest. I mean, I think it'd be a strange ticket to write on. But in the name of this so-called liberty thing, what they're really doing is destroying public institutions. And in this case, the bastion of, of our society, that is, that is our public education. So all of that is said to say that I, those are my strongly held feelings and ev based on evidence of what I see going on in the attack on our public schools. And the good news, ladies and gentlemen, is despite all of that, we still have the majority of people are rational, behave rationally, and we have wonderful things going on in our public schools. So despite what these people try to do, we still turn out great students from our public school system, albeit that they're not funded in the way they ought to be funded, etc. But I have to, so, so, so back to the subject of the school calendar year, I, it isn't often you'll find me in, uh, in opposition to uh, where the t teachers stand on something. I mean, we've got an incoming call. Let's see if we can grab this uh, caller. Good afternoon, caller. Who do we have? Yeah, Clark. Uh, it's Clark. Hi, Clark. How are you? Good. How are you? I have a couple of questions. I'm going to hang up and just listen to you. Okay. Response. They're regarding the middle school curriculum. Yep. Um, what's your take on teachers who don't require kids to do any homework? In other words, they don't assign any homework. And my other question has to do with teachers in the city who, instead of having kids read in the classroom, they put in like an audio CD where all the kids have to do is follow along. So if you could just give us your response to that, that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, Clark. Thank you for the call. I appreciate it. So, uh, uh, well, like, um, all right. Uh, so first off, let me see. Uh, let me take the second one first, which is the, uh, let me think, there's the audio issue and the other, uh, let me remember, what was it? It was the audio issue and people following a lot, oh, and the homework issue. So we go back to the homework issue. The audio issue, um, I'm, I'm not really aware of it. Um, I think it would be a problem if teachers are sort of, you know, not teaching, sort of coming in with a tape, uh, I don't know how old-fashioned am I with tape, or whatever medium it is, and saying, here, listen to this, and then sitting at the back of the class, you know, uh, with their legs crossed, uh, uh, that would be a, a problem. On the other hand, um, and I don't know of that, and so if, if that was happening clearly, I think it's 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 at its face is is uh, is not uh, is not right. How, however, and if that were happening, I'd be very worried about it. I'm not saying it's not. I just haven't come across it. However, I do know that. Uh, that there are teachers who make uh, who make uh, uh, great use of uh, of uh, audio and visual uh, audio visual materials in order to teach their classes, and so um, I, I think of one teacher in mind who I think who does it wonderfully. He teaches uh, uh, social studies at uh, at West High School, and uh, he has created lots of modules uh, of of his uh, classes that are available online. So uh, children can go home at night time and on the weekends, and they can actually uh, uh, re-listen to what he has uh, uh, taught during the day or what he has taught previously. And uh, he has combined other pieces of video and information. So it's a wonderful tool, and uh, as a result that particular teacher who um, uh, I, I'm almost ready to mention but I, I leave him unmentioned for now I think most people or many people who are at such will know who it is but his academic results we look at the AP the advanced placement scores coming out of his classes because he put he has put so much effort into the media that he's using um, 
that uh, his academic results uh, uh, are, are uh, well above the state averages, average and, and the highest in the state in terms of AP for things like, uh, 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 you know, world history, European history, etc. So, so I guess there's the spectrum, right? There's like the person who's done it very well and is using these th- tools to enhance you know, but this, here's a, a gentleman who was walking around a classroom, engaged with students, driving them to think more deeply about things, you know, offering counter arguments, trying to get them to look at things from other points of view, et cetera, the things that teachers do when they're doing their job very well. I think, Clark, your, your uh, uh, scenario of a teacher um, coming in and, and, uh, and offering an audio tape or any kind of tape for that matter and saying, here, listen to this. I think this would even be true of, uh, even if it was a very well-made product, I think if that was what they were doing sort of on a regular basis, that like they talked to the kids and taught on Monday and Tuesday and then Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, it's like, here, listen to this, the one that I made last year and I'm going to, that would be problematic. So I'm sorry I haven't been very concise in my response to you, but I, you, I think you understand what I'm saying. If, if, it's, if it's laziness... Um, then, then obviously it's something should be reported. I don't think anybody would support that, or if they are, I, I'd be very surprised. It just, uh, it just isn't on. Um, if it's a, if it's an, in, if it's an enhancement and getting kids more excited about what they're doing. And I understand from what you're saying, it sounds like they probably aren't ex- that excited about it because that's what I gleaned from your, inf- your, what you said, uh, even albeit very short. So. Um, yeah, if, if, if it was just simply kids sitting in a room and listening to some boring droning tape, um, then that would be a very bad thing. Um, however, if people are using technology and using it well, I've seen that work and it's just exciting and kids are sitting on the edge of their seat uh, doing it. Um, you know, I like to think of myself as somebody who's capable of, <laughs> of giving a yes and no answer uh, when asked a direct question. Um, and yet often, and I do many times, and if you want to call up on other things, I have, I'll give you some yeses and nos. Um, with regard to teachers not giving homework, I, I, I have to say from my point of view, see, as a non-educator, um, and it's not a, that's not a cop-out, it's just that, you know, this, but I'm not an educator myself. I'm surrounded by them, and I come from a long line of teachers uh, um, back in my in my my original home country of Ireland. But had I become a teacher, I would have been like a fourth generation teacher or something. But um, however, the whole idea. So, from my point of view, homework and giving homework, it, it it seems to me that important work gets done when a student learns to go home and do some, you know. Uh, 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 self-study or further study that can be then can be achieved in the classroom, and and it seems to me that that something's lost if you're not if you're not doing that. How, however, I, I, I that was that was my starting point, and then I know of schools um, that don't like school systems that that have like a no homework uh, policy. I know in the state in this in the Manchester school district it is policy that n- nobody can a, a, a teacher cannot grade homework greater than 10%. So or, or let me put it another way the homework portion of of any course cannot comprise more than 10% of the score. And so I was told some years ago about a teacher at one of our high schools who uh, described to me the environment in which he was teaching. And he talked about, you know, especially as courses were leveled from, you know, the kids in the, the, the there were kids in the school who were very engaged and, and you know, anxious to move forward and, you know, just had arrived early at a sense of maturity of where they wanted to go and knew that this was their ticket to get there. And then there were the kids who were still, you know, staring blankly into the into space and as part of that conversation he said that he had students who approached him at the beginning of every year knowing the policy was that no greater than 10% of uh, of the uh, course uh, grade could be attributed to homework that they would walk up to him the the the, the kids who 
uh, you know, uh, knew the system, would uh, walk up to him and say to him, oh, by the way, Mr. We'll call him Mr. Smith. Uh, by the way, Mr. Smith, I won't be doing, uh, I don't do homework, so uh, I'll take the grade. I'll take the, I'll take the, my, my grade out of the 90%. Like you can mark me out of the 90 because uh, homework's not something I do. I found that, to my ears, I found that appalling. I mean, I almost would think of that as like a discipline issue or something. But, um, but that's the reality, right? Um, I think where the, where, the, uh, where, where the problem comes in is that when you, when you there, there are several, the people who would argue against homework, and I, I believe in it, but the people who would argue against it would say a number of things that, um, that there are kids going home to different environments, and so there are, play, there, there are learning rich environments, so simply in terms of space and the time. And then perhaps the encouragement of parents going all the way towards the involvement of parents, going all the way toward until you get to the point where basically parents are overseeing the homework and then homework. And you can tell in the end it's like perfectly edited and it's the mature product of somebody who has, you know, looked at this and learned it for a long time. Um, and so, And so some of the... So it becomes more nuanced at that point. Then what is this homework really worth, right? And then there's the comparative thing about the kid who goes home to an environment. And, and, and sadly, this is a substantial number of kids. And it doesn't always have to do a straight line with things like homelessness and, you know, the, the dysfunctional households and all that. But there are kids who uh, don't have the space. Uh, they don't have the encouragement of parents or the support of parents. They have a dad who's waiting almost like literally at the school gate, you know, tapping one foot on the ground because, you know, sports practice is starting and he's going to drive him down to Massachusetts to some sport he's going to do. So, um, so when you're a teacher and you get back the homework from the 50 kids that you had uh, yesterday, um, uh, there's a lot it's not a straight line between here's the, you know the very best of the papers that you were handed back is your best student who's really good at what he does and is more determined than, and that's a straight line all the way around the line gets bobbled all over the place so I my, the, the most for, most straight answer I could give you Clark is that I think it would be I'd be I'd be disturbed if my kids weren't getting homework but I do understand there are other views that people come at it in different ways. And in the end, um, I'm not a big fan of the uh, – I am a big fan of, of equity and fairness. But when equity and fairness actually mean that kids who want to progress, et cetera, are somehow held back. And in this example, I think they might be. Um, or they're not getting the full bend of what they might have. Otherwise, then I then that's where I, par I depart from the, from the fairness and equity argument. So um, – I'm always conscious. I'm always aware that you know there are room, f room for all of us to rethink our stances on things. I haven't done a lot of thinking about. I haven't because I haven't come across a no homework uh, scenario. Um, uh, I do know what happens. I do know our school districts who do it. I'm very confident, even though I haven't had my kids haven't had one of these classes themselves. But I'm very confident it happens. And by by the way, I, I think of an example. Um, at, at middle school in Manchester, where I was, I was appalled uh, once upon a time when I went to visit a uh, a middle school in in Manchester, and uh, this it was a sixth grade class or a seventh grade class, and this wonderful, really nice person who over when I got to know this person better, she, she was a very nice lady, but. Uh, going in in the early part of the year to see the product of, you know, whatever work they've been doing, you know, let me show, the sort of show and tell, whatever they call it, right? Here's what your kid's been working on. And um, and I was handed, this is an old story, I have to tell you, because it would it would almost cause me to say, I'm out of here. Um, but I was handed a, a sheet of paper, and I'll never forget it, because the sheet of paper had uh, pencil drawings of... Um, kitchen utensils uh, down one side of the page and then the names of those utensils were uh, in no particular order written down the right hand side of the page and the exercise was to draw a line from ladle the picture the drawing of the ladle across to the word ladle and like f the word fork to the fork and so the page had a series of lines across it and um there was nothing more complicated than mixer or spatula on the thing. 
But the teacher presented me with this piece of paper and a big smile and said, oh, you know, your, your student, your child, they're doing great. Uh, they got 100% on this exercise. And um, I, I, I kind of, I was in shock. I don't think I even said anything, but I was like, this is, so to, to, why I bring it up here is it's this idea of, literally this page had been photocopied a thousand times, you could tell, because it was all a little askew from having been facsimilated. Um, in, in numerous times, etc. And I'm thinking, so that's what my daughter's doing in the school now. Um, it turned out to be um, uh, much better than that. But uh, but I do, um, I have seen in, in schools, in the private schools that uh, my kids have gone to in the past, as, as in public schools, where there are some teachers who sort of, you know, start to mail it in. And uh, the page that they photocopied a thousand times over the last 10 years, and here we go, you know, module F in year two. Here's the page. Let me take this out. There you go. Um, bring that home and do it or sit and write those things out. And I, I, <clears throat> I don't know what to tell you, uh, Clark and others. In the end, there are, there are great teachers who who do great work and put a lot of effort in. And, I, and I, I, I see it every day because, you know, when I go to extracurricular activities, and I, I, I'm lucky enough that I get to go to quite a few, and whether it's arts and music or theater or, or, or and band and all those things or sports or um, all the things, spelling bees and geography bees and um, uh, et cetera around the, around the city, um, I see teacher. I see the teachers, and there are some teachers who who you will never see at those events, and there are some teachers who you will see there all the time, and so that's a, a different example. It's an example of teachers putting in time over and above, the uh, over and above what is required. Which sort of to, and then there are the ones. I don't know this literally. But because I don't ever see them outside of hours, they're the people who show up, you know, drive into school, do their class. They may do a wonderful job. And that, in the end, ladies and gentlemen, that's all they get paid to do too, right, is to do their job, teach all day. And when the bell rings, you know, they do whatever they have to do. They get in the car and they drive off. Um, I guess we've been spoiled by teachers too often, uh, giving us a hell of a lot of, uh, of, of uh, effort um, over and above what they are. Uh, what they're actually required to do. And uh, when I hear my, uh, you know, people talk about the private sector and, well, this is what's expected and that's what you have to do nowadays, and I call BS and all of that because, you know, um, I, I, uh, I, I like to think I've had a fair amount of experience of working both um, and, and, and in various industries, et cetera, and, uh, and there are a few places. You know, if you go to a technology company today, um, I've worked in startups for quite a while and, uh, you know, people were often work 50 hours a week, you know, they might work 60 hours a week. Um, but they also like might come in, you know, call in and say, I'll be in two hours late on Monday because they've got a dental appointment and there's really nobody standing. If you, I don't know what happens actually at places like, uh, say Dine, no, 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 Oracle. I don't know, it's literally, uh, or, uh, Core Street or whoever the other technology companies in the, in the, uh, in the city. But, um, if they're like all the other ones, there isn't anybody clocking in. There is no clock to clock in and clock out. They're not told like Manchester teachers, by the way, aren't allowed to leave the school building. Like during lunchtime, they can't get in their car and go drive down town and grab a sandwich you'll never find like four teachers sitting around at baked or or um, uh, some other or at mint or something on elm street uh, having a quick bite of lunch because by policy they're not allowed to leave um if you worked at antler or any place else there's nobody standing at the door at lunchtime saying you can't go across the street and have a coffee with your buddy so anyway let's leave that uh, let's leave that where it is clark i appreciate the call those are two um, excellent questions, and and uh, I'd love to know if there is more behind them that we we have uh, uh, that 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 there you know if if there's if to finish with the topic I would say that if there's a teacher that you're aware of that is uh, playing tapes for kids and basically like sitting back and and allowing kids to self educate off of some tape, then I would bring that to the notice of uh, of the principal. And uh, or to the to the uh, to the uh, superintendent, and I'm pretty confident that he would take action in uh, in regards to it. 
So just to quickly, I just want to finish with the issue of the school, the calendar year. So I was saying that you won't often find me uh, in outright uh, opposition to uh, the stance of teachers. I understand, I've, I've asked, and I'm hoping that we'll have um, uh, uh, Maxine and Sue, uh, the two, two people from the uh, Man Manchester Education Association on here in the next week or two, but... Um, I understand that the contract is a legally binding document. Um, and so this was entered into in good faith by both sides, and the contract is the contract. And you can't just go around willy-nilly and decide we're going to change this. But at the, and, and I also believe that there's a sense of um, hard done by -ness, perhaps, on behalf of uh, teachers um, Given the fact that they're heading into a year now without, uh, again, without a, without a new contract, with no money in place for a contract, and so the struggle again to just maintain their current status or their current income level in real terms, that battle is going to start again, and they will probably lose like they did the last time and the time before that, and they're kind of tired of being asked to give up. To, that's their view of the world. So I understand all the frustrations, but I have to tell you. Dr. Vargas asked for something because it would make life better for the students because there should be, in his view, more seat time, more time in front of teachers. Every hour of instruction has an effect on academic outcomes. And academic outcomes is a very arcane way of describing, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge base of the kids when they leave the system. So if you take five days out of their school year over five years, then you've taken a week out of their school year, which is probably something in the order of, you know, whatever percentage it is of the total. I just think the teachers are in the wrong place in this one. I understand that legally they were correct, but um, I think there could have been a quid pro, pro quo. I know that uh, Mayor Craig uh, uh, did voice her disappointment that agreement couldn't be reached, and uh, Dr. Vargas expressed his disappointment that, as he called it, I think, I think he might have called it uh, that common sense hadn't prevailed. I'm not sure if that's the way he, if that's the way he put it. I think he. Uh, if, I, if I, I had it up here earlier, um, uh, school board member, do, 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 where is he? Um, he said, uh, do, do, uh, Mayor Craig said, we were hopeful that we could reach a compromise, but we didn't. I've heard from a number of parents and teachers who support this Tuesday start, but we are in a contract. That was uh, Sue Hannon, the, uh, the head of the uh, teachers uh, union, said that uh, uh, the calendar is nothing to die on a hill for said Hannon. I think she's right about that. Uh, she said, we have been publicly chastised for not being collaborative. Collaborative doesn't mean let's berate you in public. This has been stirred up for no reason. Starting school on a Wednesday is not out of the ordinary. Well, yeah, I, I, I just don't, I like Sue and I just don't agree with her in this case. Um, she is right. The 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 the, uh, the calendar is nothing to die in a hill for. I think the contract's nothing to die in a hill for either, and uh, and that's where the problem is here. And um, in the end, uh, you know, Wednesday may be nothing out of the ordinary, but it would be much nicer to have school start on Tuesday. And if there isn't a compelling reason for uh, for going to the Wednesday other than that's what was negotiated, I. I uh, I, I find that a problem. As I said in my last program we talked here, I think it was particularly problematic and a mistake on behalf of Sue Hannon to indulge in a, a, a semi-negotiation sort of half-apology explanation And I, I'm, you know, I, I, at, at a school board member. I would have gone into attack mode, not because I would have wanted to be belligerent, but I would have pushed back hard on some of the kind of anti-teacher sentiment that was coming across from some people. I wouldn't have accepted that. And I think I would have gone more boldly and said, look, you know, I would, have, I would have turned to the cameras and said, you're coming back to teachers looking for another what seems like a very reasonable thing, and we're reasonable people, but you've been chipping away at this old block for a long time, and we've just decided we don't, this is not a chip we want coming off the block. We, what will you, what, what can we, can we not make this part of our uh, negotiation for a new contract? Let's do it there, and I'm sure we can reach agreement. But that wasn't done, so that's neither here nor there. Tonight, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I was conflicted uh, tonight because 
There is a hearing on starting at six o'clock, so it's now half an hour old uh, at City Hall on now Tuesday, the the the, the tenth of uh, of April, and it's the public hearing on the budget. Uh, by charter, the city is required to have a public meeting on the char- on the uh, on the budget before uh, a vote can be taken to implement the budget. Um, uh, I, for a minute, in my paranoia, I thought maybe they scheduled a public hearing, uh, knowing that uh, at least one voice would be missing. Um, but I obviously I don't, I'm not so vain to think that that was the case. Uh, but I do regret not being there tonight. I did go to both boards, the school board and the board mayor, and all of a meeting last month to express to them my feelings about the fact that we had the least well-funded school system in the state, the largest class sizes in the state, and that we were going to perpetuate that and not take any action against it. Um, and that's, what the, that's the essence of what I would be saying if I were before the, that board tonight. Um, hopefully some people have gone and are speaking as I speak tonight that they are speaking right now against the budget and describing it as being inadequate for, for uh, the purpose that we need. However, on the good news, last night we did have the vote taken on the uh, on the uh, redistricting plan. Plan, and um, if we can, uh, if I can just find it here, um, uh, I'm I'm so I'm, I'm I'm pleased because this is the la- this is like a 17 year effort in the city of Manchester. Now I don't expect it to be. The um, I don't expect it to be the end of the uh, discussion because I'm sure there are those who are going to go back and uh, and want to uh, relitigate this over and over and over again. Um, just to do a quick head count on how the vote went, um, the uh, the vote. Let's see. So voting in favor, uh, quoting from the union leader, not to plagiarize them. Uh, school board members voted late Monday night to allow Superintendent of Schools Dr. Bolgan, Bolgan Vargas to move forward with his redistricting plan as funds become available. The plan, including a slow migration of fifth grade students to middle schools beginning on the city's west side in September of 2019, so that's a full year from now, passed by eight votes to five. Voting in favour were Sarah Ambrosi, David Scannell, Leslie Want, Lisa Freeman, Jimmy LaHoo, Art Baudry, Katie DeRochers and Dan Bergeron. Opposed were Rich Gerard, Ross Terrio, John Avard, Kelly Thomas and Mayor Joyce Craig. After the vote, Craig and Terrio said they voted no only because they were hoping to take up the discussion again at a future meeting, not because they opposed the plan. Um, I, I understand that, uh, however, um, given the, 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 the fact that this uh, thing has gone on for so long in the city of Manchester and so much time and energy has been spent on it, Dr. Vargas has clearly demonstrated the capacity to get his hands around this problem, to do the hard lifting. He's been out into the, he's met with the public, the public generally is in approval. Um, he's had the work done by architects. He's done the scoping and scaling of the what's available in the schools. It's the best effort by far. I think any any um, dispassionate observer would say that, with all due respects to previous superintendents and to other efforts, that um, that this uh, proposal, as put forth by um, Dr. Vargas, is uh, is a pretty sound uh, is a pretty sound plan. Um, uh, so, so uh, there were there obviously were some individual. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Avard, uh, his his worry was that this uh, change would be implemented on the west side, and that uh, and that once that was done, that once again the steps the the, the the west side would become the step child of the city, and the changes wouldn't be made on the east side. And I think there was some. Um, I, I had some sympathy for that view, but you know, uh, the plan is to move ahead with this. I liked what Dave Scannell had to say uh, when he said there are times when board members have to know when to when to uh, uh, you know step out of the way and uh, by inference allow progress to occur. And I think the right thing here was for people to step out of the way. And I think the smarter school board members. Uh, last night were were aware that this wasn't perfect. Think about Sarah Ambrosi in Ward 1 who said, look, you know, there's an issue at Webster School and this plan is not going to do anything for Webster School immediately because of the fact that 
um, it's going to start on the west side to begin with and then as it's phased in it will take time before it, it sort of uh, affects uh, Webster and there is an issue with Webster that ne needs now to be resolved. However, you know, she wasn't going to stand in the way of the the plan writ, writ large because ultimately it was a good plan for the city. The biggest... Um, let me take the synopsis as given here in the union leader as being a reasonable... Um, uh, so it says, according... And I'll just read from the union leader today. So according to a district-wide... Facility study completed by CMK Architects. I mean, that's the right place. Uh, we don't want to go there. Under the um, so, under the redistricting proposal approved Monday, students on the city's west side in grades, in grades 5 through 8 would attend middle school starting in September 2019, so a year from now. The proposal to move fifth grade students to middle schools in 2019 applies only to students on the west side for now. Because ultimately, what under this proposal, well, let me read this and I'll go into my synopsis in a sec. Under the proposal, elementary schools on the west side would include students in K through 4 beginning in September 2019. According to Vargas, eliminating a grade in elementary school buildings frees up space and achieves the goal to reduce the class sizes at the elementary level. The new plan adjusts the current uh, school feeder pattern for September 2018, so that's this September, and sends Beach Street elementary students to McLaughlin Middle School and then to Manchester High School Central. Uh, currently, I think Beat Street is divided. This pattern reunites all of Beat Street students at one middle school in 2018 with all Beat Street students going on to Central for ninth grade, said Vargas. According to Vargas, the redistricting proposal requires 14 new full-time positions, the reallocation of four existing positions, over 200,000 in debt service for modification of buildings, and 358,000 in math curriculum resources. In all, the total impact on the fiscal year 2019 budget is projected at 1.3 million, or one. 1,337,000. The plan, the plan includes steps to meet family and student demand to attend MST in 2018 through a collaboration between MST and Memorial High School. The redistricting plan also proposes constructing a preschool centre at Memorial High School to serve students with, devel de with developmental needs at an estimated cost of 1.6 to 2.2 million. And that's that figure of $200,000 in debt services, what uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so that's... Um, that's uh, uh, the last piece of the union leader says Vargas believes the proposal will help the school district achieve the following goals by 2025. Now, six years away in terms of academic years. 80% of students in K through 8 will be proficient in reading and math. 20% of, or, sorry, 60% of middle school students would complete Algebra 1 for high school credit. That's very important, I think. The four-year high school graduation rate would improve from the current 76%. It's actually 77%. The, as we were reported uh, to last night, the uh, graduation uh, rate in Manchester went for, up by 1% last year from 76 to 77. But he's saying we're going to get it to 90%, which would be higher than the statewide average of 88%. 95% of students would earn a certificate of employability and citizenship and be prepared for college, career, or the military. So he's saying 90% would graduate, 95% including other certificates of employability, etc. And that's um, uh, so that's what uh, what he would hope would happen. I think the big picture, ladies and gentlemen, is this: is that we have a legitimate redistricting plan that's going to uh, uh, set our our district up for more success in the future. The biggest single part, albeit implemented originally, uh, initially on the west side, um, the biggest single part will be changing the elementary schools from a K through 5 model to a K through 4 model. And then fifth grade will, be, will go into the middle school. So fifth grade will be added to south side, McLaughlin and hillside over the next over the next uh, the, 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 over two year two year period, starting the year after the West is done. I said that kind of backwards, right? So initially it'll be the kids on the West side. So starting in September of two thousand and nineteen, the fifth grade classes that are currently at Gosler, um, uh, Park of Varney, and Northwest would be absorbed into um, Parkside Middle School, and Parkside Middle School will now will then have. Uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and so work will be done to reconfigure Parkside. It's a minimal amount of 
money. I, I mean, you know, I don't know, t some tens of thousands, not 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 hundreds. Um, so that the school, so that there will be a uh, the proper provisioning for fifth grade into uh, into our middle schools and then uh, and then the following year and so once those classes leave one one class will have left the middle school so there'll be additional space freed up at northwest and at gosler and at barker varney they're also on the west side going to take the current model which is a multi uh, kids of different grades learning at the, together at the same time so um it's like the montessori method um that's been successful, dramatically successful in raising grades at uh, at Park or Varney. So the idea is to is to uh, bring that model into Northwest and um, and uh, Gosler over time. Um, so that's the biggest single change right there. Uh, eventually you will see that happen with the schools and as the schools are configured and their new you know the, the new feeder program was done last um, last uh, uh, this current this current year so now you'll have you'll end up with um, on uh, going into hillside you would have Smith Road Webster McDonough and Wilson uh, the fifth graders from those four schools as well as the fifth graders from Beat Street would be at Hillside, or sorry, uh, just those first four, Smith Road, Webster, McDonough, and Wilson. Those uh, four schools, fifth grades, would be brought into Hillside, and on upon graduating Hillside after four years, they would go to Central. And then and they'd be joined by the Beach Street uh, students. Um, Green Acres, Weston, and Beach Street would be going to uh, McLaughlin, and then on to Memorial. And then Hallsville, Jewett, Highland Goss Falls, Bakersville uh, would go to Southside and then on to Memorial. So when Dr. Vargas talked about this whole idea originally, uh, what was the first thing that struck me in his response to my questions was, we shouldn't be doing redistricting for the sake of doing redistricting just so to so simply you know, move kids around so that we can ease our pain. Our pain that the only reason that the, one of the prime reasons that or metrics we should use in developing a redistricting plan is is that we are improving the potential outcomes and the educational experience for all the children across all the district and by implication equally and that came as uh, a surprise to me or at least it's a, a new thought and uh, and he was pursuing that from the beginning and so one of them and he he will be here on this program we've had to delay it because of the work he's been doing and the poor man's out I don't know how many nights a week on behalf of the district but he will be here the first week of May now and we'll talk about it but uh, so one of the things that will happen is that um, you know currently sixth grade in our middle schools uh, sixth graders are are pretty much, I don't mean totally isolated, because they're not fully isolated, but they're effectively uh, corralled um, within our middle schools. Um, and so that corralling would happen for fifth and sixth grade as opposed to just uh, sixth grade. But it allows opportunity for um, uh, foreign language and the other things that are being done at middle schools to be offered. The, the skill sets and the teachers with those skill sets are already in the middle schools. So integrating in the fifth grade becomes easier as opposed to trying to bring those skills into the elementary schools where um, uh, it just becomes more difficult. So there are advantages to the fifth graders being in this new model. There's another advantage in that currently um, – a challenge that uh, that parents have, I think, and students too, is that uh, kids spend five years in a in an, or six years, including kindergarten, at an elementary school, and um, and then they move to a middle school in what are the most uh, 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 troubled, I suppose, or challenging period of a young person's life. It's a time when they're developing physically and mentally and academically and they're being challenged socially, etc. There's a lot going on in an 11-year-old's uh, world and 12-year-old's and 10-year-old's. Um, and so at the most challenging part of their uh, lives, we pluck them out, we put them in a new school 
and you know in the six seven and eight grade model they're there for a year and they get acclimatized by the middle of that year perhaps and and then they're really comfortable with it by the time they get to the end of seventh grade and then at eighth grade they're out of there and parents also sort of rush through that middle school process after having this longer six-year period at elementary school you know, the first year they go to a PTO meeting, they don't know anybody. The second year they perhaps volunteer, they have a year actually working in the PTO and then they're gone. So with the four-year model, there'll be more continuity between the grades. And one of the things I've talked about often in our school district is the lack of vertical integration. And by that I mean the, the, that the handoff from middle school from from grade school to middle school or elementary school to middle school and from middle school to high school is like there, there's like there, the handshake is not very good there's no time for um, there's no time for for any uh, any any uh, nuanced um, explanation of who these kids are and uh, teachers introducing their body of students to the new teacher and stuff doesn't really happen. So kids, one day arrives and at the end of uh, one one spring or early summer, they uh, they they leave the school and they get dropped off at a new school the first of September and it uh, it's every man for himself. So this idea that you will have a kid uh, for four years in a middle school where a principal and an administrator, uh, social workers. Uh, 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 remedial teachers, uh, all the support staff that are there will just get to know these kids and understand them and know something about them. And so I think that's a real advantage to students and their sense of comfort um, and also to the, to the people who are working with these bodies of students to be more intimately involved in their lives or understand them better. And that, that in the end, I think will be a good thing. I think from an educational point of view, um, it uh, the model works elsewhere. It's done elsewhere. I believe in uh, that. Uh, so many of the principals went and visited uh, like Goffstown, where is the, the which is because it's the model that's uh, followed there. Um, it also is going to uh, offer the opportunity for um, uh, the school district to uh, to uh, take some of the programs that are available at middle schools and be able to, uh, and now have another year in which they, they, those, uh, some of those subjects might be offered um, to, uh, to fifth graders. The idea here under this new model, the idea is to have, I forget what it was, 60% of students uh, uh, be able to, I think it said 60% of students would have access to or be, be completing Algebra 1 in their middle school year. And... Um, I was going to call it a dirty little secret, but you know what is what is not well understood by many um, who are not paying attention is that you know the 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 math model for people who want to go on and excel at careers in technology and mathematics and the STEM subjects. Um, there's a there's a there's a line you know if you're not doing if you have if, if if you haven't gotten to do pre-algebra by the time you get to your eighth grade then you're not ready to do algebra and then geometry and then pre-calculus and then calculus that's the, that's the track over the, those those five years starting in eighth grade with pre-algebra and where we've been with pre-algebra in our middle schools in Manchester is we have one class available, and I've railed against this for years because that class is maxed out at, say, 30 kids, which is already way too big. It should be 24 maximum by most people's estimate. But in Manchester, it's 30. But what happens when you have a class year at Southside or Parkside or Hillside or whatever, and in that year there are 39 kids who, who have shown the capability, the willingness, and the intellect, and the application to uh, at, at that they're ready for pre-algebra in eighth grade. Well, what happens currently is nine of them are told, sorry, you know, they're not actually told at all. Nine of them are, are not chosen for the pre-algebra class, and they end up not doing pre-algebra. And so therefore, right there, at the moment that that decision is made at a principal's desk, at an assistant principal's desk, by a teacher somewhere at the end of seventh grade, there's there, that, 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 while not catastrophic, that decision that often parents aren't fully aware of and aren't clued in on, that decision can determine whether your kid's going to be doing calculus by the time they finish high school or not.
Now, none of it is determinate. None, none of it is uh, uh, no, such that it can't be fixed. But these are the tracks that people are sent on. And, uh, and so the idea of having students doing pre-algebra uh, or, or doing Algebra 1 in uh, middle school would mean that, that uh, you know, if they're ready for advanced, more advanced thinking than, than in, in math, then they are being requested and is being requested of them now. That uh, they would have a they would have a step up going into uh, going into uh, high school. So the whole you you can look at this redistricting plan and talk about it in terms of bricks and mortar and buildings and why is Goffs Falls doing this and why is Webster doing that and what about Northwest for this and when well, there's there's you know McDonough for that and you could go into all the you know the nuances and get deep into the weeds. Um, the way to view the redistricting as proposed by Dr. Vargas, and hopefully he'll be on here soon to go into it in greater detail, is that it's a much more holistic view of redistricting. And I, for one, am very, um, very pleased um, that that we have this uh, this um, superintendent amongst us, that he has shown the uh, the ability to do this. And ultimately, I'm grateful to the school board, uh, to the eight of them, who voted in favor of this of this plan going forward? There are some uh, uh, who are married to their own, you know, um, plans that they developed themselves. Mr. Gerard was at pains to point out that he thought that the plan he represented uh, was was a better plan, and he's entitled to his opinion. Um, but uh, in the end, you pay, you pay a superintendent to do uh, work, and uh, I think he's done a remarkable job, and he deserves to be commended. Um, I'm hoping that now that the school board has actually approved this plan after the best part of 20 years uh, debating this and going around and round, that we have set ourselves up for um, for uh, success, and we've got metrics against which we can measure this, and promises that could, that, are, that have been made that, if not kept, will be will be uh, known. Um, the other thing, of course, is that. Um, uh, besides that big change, the other change is that the preschool would be uh, would be built as part of Memorial. So part of Memorial High School will be reconfigured with a separate entrance, um, so that there will be a single site for preschoolers, so that they won't be in in programs scattered around the city with people driving between one place and another, etc. That they will go to one place, and that in itself, uh, I think the cost of doing that is uh, around around about 1.5 million. Uh, but the original proposal that uh, was out there was to build a standalone or to convert an existing building for um, preschool, and that, that was uh, around the $5 million mark. So here's a $5 million expenditure that's been taken off the taxpayer and lowered to a $1.5 million. I would also like to point out that I found it... Um, I found it uh, troubling last night when listening to school board members asking. It's amazing when I talk to them and tell them that, you know, we need to uh, better finance our school district and it's under-resourced, et cetera. And they say to me, uh, you know, it's all tut-tut and, well, we, we're not doing it, we can't do it. But they insisted then in asking questions last night about um, – about uh, uh, you know temporary structures at Northwest or the you know the, the the size of classes there and the amount of building that's going on in that area and the number of homes being built and uh, new new developments in the North End that are going to add to the uh, to the number of students that are at Webster School and all the rest of it and I'm like hang on a minute all you like you're the very people who are sitting here saying we won't add we won't spend money on building a new school we won't spend money on reconfiguring a, a school we know we you know we're, we're we're just not going to spend money on anything because oh by the way everything is fine we're not going to buy, buy books we're not going to buy curriculum we're not going to pay for professional development we're actually going to do nothing because everything's fine we've got a great schools and isn't it all lovely but when they don't like a proposal from dr vargas all of a sudden they're willing to recognize that there are real issues in our school district so I'm excited, ladies and gentlemen, put a big X on the calendar that uh, in the year of our Lord, 2018, 
we uh, we managed to get a redistricting plan passed in the city of Manchester, which I think is going to work wonderfully well for the students, the parents, the taxpayers, the teachers, the administrators, and everybody in the city. I couldn't be more pleased. I think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, compromise. I compliment Dr. Vargas on the work that he has done. Um, I'm sure there'll be some growing pains, pains as it goes along, but it's a wonderful start, and uh, we can put this behind us. And now that that's put behind us, we can begin to concentrate on the work of improving our schools. And I, by the way, I love the fact that one of his proposals was to reintroduce French as a foreign language, given the uh, the wonderful city that this is with its French background. Um, that would be a wonderful re-addition back into our uh, schools. Ladies and gentlemen, time is up once again. We've reached the wire. Thank you for uh, for paying attention. Thank you for those who called in. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all again next week. All the best now.